Hi, I'm James Verdeer and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today's episode is the next in our In Their Own Words oral history series in which we talk with scientists who have made great contributions to their fields, particularly in the biological sciences. This week's guest is Dr. Nalini Nadkarni, who is a professor of biology at the University of Utah. Let's go to the interview. Dr. Nadkarni, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Okay, so our first question is, when did you first know that you wanted to work in the life sciences? Well, I think as, you know, with almost every scientist, it started out as a kid. And for me, it was climbing trees. Um, uh, I really loved climbing trees. My family was kind of a large, chaotic, mixed family. My dad was a, a Hindu from India. He was a scientist. My mom was a, was a communicator. She's an Orthodox Jew from Brooklyn, New York. And there were five kids and dogs and cats and homework and and chores and so forth. And so for me, being able to run outside the front door and climb a tree was my refuge. It was my place. There was no one else in my family that climbed trees. And it was there that I really felt at home, at peace, not bothered. And there were also really cool, interesting things to look at, like where were the squirrels going and why did the branch of the tree heal in this way? And so that really kind of made me want to take, and in fact, I did. I, when I was about eight or nine years old, I took this oath when I was in, in one of those trees um, saying that I really, when I'm a grown up, I want to do something that will protect trees because they've given me so much as a little kid. And it wasn't really until college that I discovered the world of ecology. I had a wonderful professor named Dr. John Wagi. He studied damselflies and I realized, wow, somebody can actually make a living by observing nature and, and writing about it. And so that's when I thought that's the career for me. That's fantastic. And what were those trees that you know you were first climbing as a child? So there was this row of eight maple trees. They were sugar maple trees that lined the driveway of my parents' home. They were very inviting. They had big, wide crowns. They were very safe. And, um, you know, some of them sort of where the crotches were, there were these little platforms, and I could sort of stand there and re recite poetry and sing songs to myself and, and dream of what my life might be as someone who could, who could save trees. Oh, that's exciting. And so no fear of heights, I take it. Uh, no, no fear of heights. Uh, a respect for heights, but no fear of heights. That's fortunate. So uh, you knew that from a very early age that this is sort of, you know, the angle that you wanted to pursue. And it was a, a sort of a conservation minded approach. Right. Again, it was without <clears throat> it was it was a sense of wanting to do something for trees, but not exactly knowing how I would do that. I mean, I pictured, oh, maybe I could be a firefighter or or maybe I could be a forest ranger. Because at that time, I just didn't know that there was a way for people to study trees as a way, a pathway to help protect them. And then how do you figure that out, you know, once you're an undergraduate or whenever that revelation kind of comes to comes to pass? Yeah, I, I think you you figure that out by looking at um, other people who are doing those kinds of things. I mean, Dr. Wagi, my, my biology ecology professor, talked about how he published papers about damselflies and how certain damselflies only only inhabit very clean water, streams that have clean water. And so he let us know that his work was relevant to water pollution and understanding it and maybe mitigating it by understanding where these different damselflies went. And so that was an early connection between the world of academic science and the world of restoration biology or conservation or sustainability. And, you know, what was your undergrad experience like? Was it all classroom or were you out in the field? And, you know, what, what were those experiences like? Yeah, my, I have to say that my my undergraduate experience is sort of like me, kind of a mixture, uh, just like my parents were a mixture. My interests were a mixture. I really loved field ecology, and, and I loved discovering the world of ecology. And I did labs with Dr. Wagi, you know, where we would go out into the field. But I, my second love was modern dance and art, the arts. And uh, I had taken modern dance ever since I was four years old as a little kid. Um, it was a it was a realm of expression, of creative expression using the body. Um, and I knew as I took modern dance classes in college and came to understand what the life of a modern dancer was and understanding what the life of a field ecologist was, I probably couldn't do both. And so my senior year of college, I said, well, how do I find out what it's really like to be a field ecology, what it's really like to be a modern dancer? And of course, in college, you don't know. You're just taking classes. It's kind of a, a mimicry of what it's really like. So the year after I graduated from college, um, I found a 
a job opportunity. I, I wrote letters to like 60 different field stations all over the world saying, I would like to find out what it's like to be a field ecologist. And I would like to be an apprentice and I don't need much money. I'll just, I'll just help you out. And I got one letter back from the WOW Ecology Institute in Papua New Guinea. It was this tiny little field station. And the director, Dr. J. L. Gressid, who was a beetle taxonomist said, well, if you can make your way out here to Papua New Guinea, you can be my field assistant. So that was the perfect opportunity to fly to Papua New Guinea. I worked for a year as a field assistant in this little station in the remote highlands of Papua New Guinea, interacting with the biologists and ecologists who were there. And then I had to try out modern dance. And so I traveled to Paris and I found a dance studio there to kind of do the same thing, be the apprentice, be the, be the dancer in this world of professional dancers. And at the end of two years, then I sat down in a Parisian cafe with all of my journals, read through them and said, field biology. And that's what I decided to do. Because, you know, you could work for until you're very old. Dr. Gressa was almost 70 years old and he was still going strong. Whereas the dancers, you know, at age 30, you're kind of washed up as a performer. And you have to live in a city if you want to be a dancer. And the people who were dancers in that company were not the giving, open, eager people that I encountered at this field station. So that's when I decided to go to graduate school in forest ecology. And that's the sort of the direction that I pursued ever since. That's an incredible story. So when you were in Papua New Guinea, you, were you thinking that, you know, this is kind of the way that I'm leaning and I still want to give modern dance a good shot? Or, you know, was it that you were just genuinely unsure for that entire time? Well, when I was in Papua New Guinea, you know, waking up to the sounds of birds of paradise, Ragiana birds of paradise, and seeing these incredible pandanus trees and the epiphytic rhododendrons, you know, hard to resist that. Um, but I did want to keep an open mind and say, you know, this is just one part of me. Let's let's be fair and give modern dance a shot. And there were definite pleasures in doing modern dance and to, you know, to committing to that life of creativity, of performance, of, of expression. And I, I love that. Um, but when I really kind of sat down and did the cons and pros uh, and looked into myself to figure out how could I fulfill that oath as a little girl that I took about protecting trees, it seemed that field biology was the right way to go. Okay, and I'm interested in talking just a little bit about you know that initial field research period. Uh, what kind of work were you doing? You've mentioned, you know, waking up to the sounds of birds of paradise, but what was the actual day-to-day -day experience like? Well, the job was really following around Dr. Gressit with um, a plant press. He was interested in leaf feeding beetles. That was his work. He was a biogeographer and a taxonomist. And so he was interested in going to all these different mountain tops in Papua New Guinea and collecting beetles to, to learn about the biogeography of these leaf feeding beetles. And he needed someone to help him with what plant, with knowing what plants these, these beetles were feeding on. So I would accompany him on these sort of crazy expeditions to the tops of mountains that, and going to villages where really a lot of, in many cases, white people had not been there before. It was, you know, a very remote. And so for me, it was like the best possible experience for a young ecologist was to see what is it like to kind of explore places that people hadn't explored before. And perhaps even more important, it was also the interactions I had with the other biologists. Some of them were studying rhododendrons, some of them were studying uh, agroecology, and they were also eager to share what they were learning with other people, with visiting biologists who would come to that station. And so I came to understand that biology is not just the pursuit of you know, the single-minded Dr. Gresset who had to get beetles at the top of the Mount Masim, but it was also about the collaborative collegial life that biologists have when they're in the field together and when they're sharing what they've learned and when they're asking new questions together. And that to me was very exciting. It sounds, was that intimidating to head out there, you know, uh, with a plane ticket? No, I was not afraid of anything. <laughs> I mean, I uh, actually flew to Sydney and then hitchhiked my way up to Cairns to, you know, to get out to Papua New Guinea. You know, when you're 22 years old and, and you've lived a life that has been basically safe and privileged. I mean, I grew up in, you know, kind of a middle-class suburban Bethesda, Maryland household. 
I my experience of the world was that it was open to me and I had no ill intent towards it nor it towards me and so I really thought nothing of of just getting on that plane and 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 heading out to this you know this remote place and as it turned out in my two years of around the world travel when I was 22 years old this was before email I had no credit card um, I just had myself and my surety that what I wanted to do was explore what would I be doing with my life and how could I contribute? And so where, how could I go wrong? That's exciting. It also probably helps to be invincible because you've just graduated from college. Yes, it does help to be invincible. <laughs> Funny, I'm no longer invincible, but that's the way it was back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is the next step in terms of you know going to grad school and deciding what you're going to study specifically um, in that environment? So when I went to graduate school, having been you know sort of convincing myself that I wanted to help trees somehow, I thought I would go in for as a master's student and just learn about you know how to grow trees or do fix deforestation or start a nursery or something like that. But my first um, summer of graduate school, I decided to take a course in tropical biology that was offered by the Organization for Tropical Studies. That's a consortium of universities that offers and offered at that time these eight-week courses for graduate students to introduce them to the world of tropical biology. So I went on one of those courses in 1979. Doug Gill was the um, uh, the professor, and there were 20 or so graduate students from all over the country that were taking this class. And it was there that I realized, oh my gosh, look in the canopy of this cloud forest. We went to Monteverde, which is actually where I've continued to do my research ever since. But just looking up into the treetops and seeing these orchids and bromeliads and mosses and ferns and monkeys and birds, and I, I asked Doug Gill, like, what is going on in the canopy? And he said, well, Melini, we don't really know much about it. You know, it's kind of hard to get up there. We've lost our prehensile tails over evolutionary time. And there's so many questions on the forest floor. You know, you don't even have to bother to go up into the canopy. But there was something about looking up into that world and realizing that, wow, this is a world that hasn't been explored. And it was actually called at that time, the last biotic frontier. I mean, the frontier and that's what scientists are supposed to do right they're supposed to explore and discover new frontiers and so that idea coupled with my inherent love of tree climbing you know i just put the two together and said well i want to study the forest canopy and find out what the heck is going on up there and so i happened to encounter a guy named don perry a graduate student at the time who had pioneered the use of mountain climbing techniques to get up into the forest canopy of lowland tropical rainforest to, to observe uh, pollination of flowers, the flowers of trees. And I just said, oh my gosh, please teach me how to climb trees. That's what I want to study. As it turned out, he needed someone to take pictures of him while he was in the canopy. And so I said, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And so he taught me the techniques of climbing trees using mountain climbing gear, harnesses, climbing ropes, et cetera, carabiners. Um, and I went back to my graduate committee at University of Washington and, and I said, that's what I want to study. I want to study what's going on in the canopy and how it relates, how what goes on in the canopy relates to the forest as a whole. Because I really see myself as an ecosystem ecologist. What are the pools and fluxes of nutrients and energy within a system? And nobody had really looked at the black box of the forest canopy in terms of ecosystem nutrient cycling or water cycling at the time. And so that's that's what I wanted to set off doing. And at first my committee was like, why do you have, that's just Tarzan and Jane stuff. You know, that isn't science. But I there was some gut feeling, some intuition like, Yes, I know there's something important going on. And so I was able to actually to get a grant from the Man and the Biosphere um, group, which was part of UNESCO at the time. They were funding basic research in rainforest ecosystems. I got one of their grants, $50,000 at that time back in, you know, 19... 80, that was a lot of money for a graduate student to have, but it allowed me to pursue my my interest in the canopy, uh, to pay my own way to do that. I had a supportive major professor, Charles Greer. Um, and so that's what I did. I ended up doing a comparison of the biomass and nutrient capital of the canopy dwelling plants in the Olympic rainforest, the temperate rainforest of Washington State with the tropical cloud forest of Monteverde. And it was really basic, I hate to say this, but it was kind of 19th century work. It, was, it wasn't discovering anything. It was just saying how many kilograms per hectare of nitrogen are in the epiphytes versus how many are in the forest floor. You know, it was, it was like just an accounting. Mm -hmm. 
But that led, as my career went on, to asking other questions that were not just descriptive, but were experimental. Uh, they were modeling questions. They were questions that involved the dynamics of the capture of nutrients by these canopy dwelling plants from atmospheric sources, how long they stay within the system in the canopy, what is the rate of their movement, their flux to the forest floor, their rates of decomposition, so that those nutrients are then available to terrestrially rooted members of the ecosystem. What is their response to disturbance, these canopy dwelling plants? What roles do they play in terms of providing food and shelter for arboreal animals, mammals, and for birds. So that single question of, you know, we ha I had to start out with, which is what is the biomass of this stuff in the canopy, turned into this very rich array of, of ecological questions that I've been able to pursue ever since. And I, th I think you've answered it in large part already, but what is the, what's it like up in the canopy? I mean, for lay people such as myself, I'm thinking leaves. Um, and I, of course, I know there's a lot more to it than that, but it, wh what's it like? Yeah, well, first of all, the canopy is just such a complex environment or or arc has such, an, uh, such a complex architecture. Um, you know, when you walk on the forest floor, you kind of see the world as two dimensional. You're walking along a plane essentially with, with trees that are kind of interrupting it with, you know, poles stuck in the ground. But when you're in the canopy, you realize, holy moly, the forest, can, the forest itself is this three-dimensional volume, and the space of this volume is occupied by these cylinders, these branches that stick out into it. Um, and those cylinders of branches then are colonized in wet forests like the temperate rainforest of Washington State or the tropical cloud forests of Costa Rica by this incredible diversity of canopy dwelling plants, what we call epiphytes, epi meaning a pond, phyte meaning plants. So they're plants that get their support but not their nutrients from their host trees. And in places like Monteverde, these tropical montane cloud forests, you can get just an incredible diversity, not only of species, but of structures. You can get everything from from these pineapple top shaped bromeliads, tank bromeliads, to these carpets of mosses, to these arrays of just delicate, beautiful orchids, to giant shrubs with leathery leaves like clusia. Um, and, and so it's almost like a forest within a forest. You know, if you're a marine biologist, you can wax eloquent about the diversity of corals on coral reefs. And the same thing is true as if I took you, James, all the way up to the top of one of my giant, you know, fig trees that I climb in Costa Rica, you would, I think, just be blown away by the diversity of shapes within the canopy, this three-dimensional volume, by the, the species diversity of these epiphytes, and then just the mass and structure that is provided by this community of canopy dwelling plants. And the other feature that I find maybe even more fascinating than the plants is that there's this accumulation of soil that, that occurs underneath this, this carpet of living plants, this what we call canopy soil or arboreal soil, which is basically comprised of the dead and decomposing epiphytes that, that die in place and just stay stuck up there. So when you get up onto one of those branches and you dig your fingers into this community of these epiphyte mats, you'll encounter this earth, this soil, like what you would expect in the backyard of your garden, highly organic histosols occupied by invertebrates. Birds then look for those invertebrates. And it's really like this, this set of mini ecosystems that are arrayed in three dimensions in those trees. And so you can just never get tired of sitting up there because you're confronted by this galaxy of little ecosystems with vascular plants, non-vascular plants, soils, invertebrates, and vertebrates, as well as microorganisms that are all just chugging away up there in three dimensions high above the forest floor. That sounds incredibly exciting. So you're, you begin to study in graduate school. Um, right. And then, you know, are you able to just, you know, get back yearly and, and study it in your, you know, next appointments and, and things like that? Yes. So I really actually have been very fortunate in being able to be supported mostly by National Science Foundation and the National Geographic Society ever since I started that graduate work. That one question has always led to another set of questions, which has led to another set of questions. And I started out alone. You know, this was kind of, I think, similar for a lot of ecological work back in the in the early 80s. 
ecologists sort of thought of themselves as lone researchers. And I certainly did. You know, I'd go out to the reserve with my backpack full of climbing gear and walk to my study tree and climb my study tree and, and carry out my research and gather my data. Um, and now, and, and so year after year, I kept doing that, but I would include other researchers, collaborate them. For instance, Peter Heights was studied uh, studied the nutrient status of epiphytes using N15 isotopes. That's something I had never done. He became a collaborator and we verified that in fact, these epiphytes really do use atmospheric nitrogen, not nitrogen that's intercepted from the leaf litter that's intercepted. Um, and now kind of, I see myself really being, as, as so many scientists are now, uh, being a, much more a collaborative scientist, one that requires the collaboration and the interactions of other kinds of scientists in order to answer the questions I'm interested in. So for example, I've, I've really been trying to more and more get at this idea of what is going on in terms of disturbance. Of these, you know, we've, I've established that these epiphyte communities are really important for nutrient cycles, for providing habitat for animals, <clears throat> for their beauty, uh, for their uh, you know, their interactions and their diversity in themselves. And so what happens when you get climate change? What happens when you get invasive species? What happens when you get forest fragments? How is that going to affect these movers and shakers of ecosystem function and diversity? So right now I'm, I'm working on a second grant proposal with colleagues who are in ecophysiology, Sybil Gotch and Todd Dawson, uh, eco-hydrology, Lauren Lohman, um, and also social scientists, because we're interested in knowing why do some farmers keep trees in their pastures with these intact epiphyte communities? What is it that motivates them to keep those trees? What, what would be the incentives we might have to provide to them to keep these old growth trees uh, existing in their pastures? And so that takes the skills of developing surveys and interviews and interpreting those from social scientists. So, so I find myself now at a place where rather than seeing myself as the lone explorer and discoverer and queen of the forest canopy individual, you know, hiking out there with my backpack full of climbing gear, I see myself as one of a team and one of a happy team that, that we can interact together um, and share each other's tools and knowledges and processes to answer the questions that we're, we're all interested in answering. Do you prefer one model to the other? I mean, it sounds like they both have their their you know benefits. I think they both have their benefits. I mean, there's nothing like just walking out into a rainforest with your backpack full of gear, you know, and shooting your lineup with your master caster, which is this thing I invented uh, to get my first lineup into the into the trees, and then just you know going up there and just and looking around for the first time. There's a certain joy in that in that action of of it's me and nature, it's me and this tree, it's me and my eyes and my ears. But then there's another joy of sitting around, you know, the campfire at night in the field and just saying, so Sybil, what did you figure out? Or, you know, Cam, what did you find in the greenhouse experiment? Or Todd, did your drone work okay? You know, so it's it's this exchange that goes on. Um, just like I think, you know, some people talk about baseball teams and they say, hey, did you see the Brooklyn Dodgers did this or that? You know, it's like that kind of interaction that that comes directly out of collaborative work that that gets you through the difficult parts and the challenges and really augments the joys that come from from discovery. That sounds exciting. Now, I, I'm just curious and I have to ask, so how does the master caster, what's the, what's the propulsion mechanism? So the master caster solves a problem that canopy, well, I had as a, as a young canopy researcher, that guy Don Perry I mentioned, who, who was climbing, pioneered these techniques to get up into the canopy, he used a crossbow to get his lines up into the forest canopy. And crossbows are heavy, and really you have to be like super strong to string them. And also this was the time of the Sandinista revolt, you know, in, in Nicaragua. And so going from the US to Costa Rica with a crossbow in my luggage was not a good thing. And so I said, I need a different invention. I need to invent something. And so I invented the Master Caster, which is just this aluminum rod. It's about oh, half a meter long. And I attached a slingshot, a powerful slingshot to one end of it with a, a fishing reel underneath it and then a little eyelid at the top. And so I can just load up that fishing reel with fishing line, attach a two ounce weight to it, pull back on the slingshot, aim for the branch and zing it up. And that fishing line goes up and over 
the branch that I aim for, hopefully. I mean, sometimes it takes several tries or sometimes it takes the whole day. But once you get the fishing line up and over the branch that you want, you tie a quarter inch nylon parachute cord to the end of that fishing line. You reel that in so that you have a nylon cord going over the rope, then you over the branch, then you tie a climbing rope onto the end of that cord, pull that up and over, then you've got your climbing rope up and over your branch, you tie off one end of the climbing rope, you get into your harness, and then using your ascenders, uh, which are clamps that go up the rope but not down, that are attached to your harness, your sit harness and your leg loops, you can basically just kind of inchworm your way up the rope, standing, sitting, standing, sitting, moving up the rope safely, comfortably, stopping whenever you want to rest or take photographs or make measurements. How long a rope do you need? It sounds like you're, you're going up pretty high, aren't you? Yeah, well, it depends on the forest and the tree, of course. Um, we use ropes that are usually, um, it ranges from between about 60 meters so that you can go up 30 meters or so. That's usually about the extent of the height that, that we climb. So you're able to get out and research pretty much on a yearly basis for, the, for most of your career. Um, how is, how's the academic side? Yeah, so the academic, it's funny. Um, you know, one of the big surprises of my career has actually been that I actually have an academic career. I never really thought, you know, in a focused way, oh, I want to be a professor. That's going to be my job. But it turns out um, my first job was a, an assistant professor at the University of California in Santa Barbara in the biology department. It was sort of a standard R1 assistant professor job, very high powered, um, very competitive, um, not easy, had lots of challenges. Um, and one thing I, I have to say before I kind of go into the sequence is that um, my husband, Jack Longino, is a, an taxonomist. And he and I uh, met when we were in graduate school in Costa Rica. It was a very romantic uh, courtship and falling in love and getting married. But we decided we didn't want to have two different academic jobs in two different places. We just didn't want to be apart. So we figured, well, whoever gets a job first, as long as the other people can do research, the other person can do research, we'll go there. So I ended up getting a, an offer right out of graduate school. In fact, I didn't even actually quite have my PhD yet, but I got an offer at UC Santa Barbara and Jack, we decided then that Jack would come along as sort of a captive spouse. And he used space in my lab to do his ant work, but he was never, he never had a position. You know, it was always the captive spouse. And then I got a job as um, the director of research at the, the Marie Selby Botanic Garden in Florida. And so we went there and again, Jack didn't have a position. He worked out of our third bedroom. Um, and then we heard of a position at the Evergreen State College for a tropical biology professor. And we decided at that time, we had just had our son, our first child, August, um, that, <clears throat> that we could apply jointly. Perhaps we could split this position. And it turned out that the Evergreen State College, which is a, sort of an alternative, um, very forward thinking, um, teaching institution. Uh, they are they were founded on the principle of interdisciplinary teaching and learning. And so they don't have class, they don't have tenure, they don't have departments, they don't have grades. It's a, it's a very alternative sort of thing. So we said, well, how about if we split this position, you'll get two people for the price of one, so to speak, in terms of our our expertise. And they, they took us both. And so we each had a half-time position at the Evergreen State College. It was wonderful for teaching. It really opened my mind to, because I was teaching with people from all different disciplines, artists and philosophers, geographers and so forth. And then because it was half-time, we each, Jack and I could also apply to NSF for grants to support the research that we wanted to do. And we could actually leave campus for whole semesters at a time because we were just one position. So it, in a funny way, going to the Evergreen State College not only developed me in terms of broadening my thinking of ways of knowing and how there are many valid ways of knowing, but it also took the pressure off of like, you have to have so many publications by the time you get tenure, because there was no tenure. And it also allowed me to have a better relationship with my husband because it wasn't me with a full-time position and him with no position, we were on equal footing. And then in 2011, we, we spent 20 years there doing that split position thing. We raised our kids there. Uh, we continued our research very actively. And then in 2011, I got a phone call from the University of Utah, and they wanted to offer me a position as the new director of their new Center for Science and Math Education. And so they 
said, would you come and join our faculty? I said, well, I, I do have a husband that is also interested in academia. So they ended up making a position for him as well. It was a spousal hire. So we've ended up here at this time of sort of senior part of our careers with both of us having tenured positions at an R1 institution with lots and lots of resources for research, for graduate students. Um, and it's worked out really well, but it, it took a long time to find that to find ways of accommodating my personal life, which was the profession of my husband, as well as the right sort of academic environment for both of us. Do you ever, you know, get the sense that the academy should do things differently in terms of the way that it handles couples who are both seeking positions? I think that's a great question. Um, it's a tough one. Um, and I have, of course, since of my personal involvement, you know, I have things to say about spousal hires, but I do understand the constraints of you know, of the couple in which the, the academic couple wants to have recognized positions for both. At the same time, it can understand, you know, the, the position of the university, which is if a department doesn't need somebody with the expertise of, of the spouse of that person, what are they to do? Um, also, I think very often couples offer more than a single person can because they've got two areas of expertise. They have sort of two energy levels that they can provide. And so you have to wonder about, you know, is this if, if they if spouses are accommodated, is that something that's sort of negative against a person that's single or doesn't have a spouse in academia? What I've seen over the 35 years of my career is that that spousal hires that splitting positions, that accommodating one spouse has become far more common and far more accommodating than it was when we were starting out. So I think the trends are, are really strong and really positive. But I think that it is always difficult and probably will always be difficult for academics who are part of a, an academic couple to find that right position that accommodates both. And so I think the advice that I would give would be to keep seeking but have patience because sometimes that balance comes in time. That is for a while, one spouse might have like the perfect position and the other one is kind of, man, this isn't so great. And then maybe five years later, there'll be an opportunity for the second person to have, this is a great position and the other one to say, yeah, this isn't so great. So I think even though it's very difficult to think in the long term and in the hopeful, I think that at least in the case for me and some of the other couples, academic couples I know, I think there is hope. I think there, is, there are ways that we can find to make that balance and sometimes compromise happen. Yeah, it sounds like kind of no matter how it shakes out, it would be a little bit challenging and require, you know, kind of uh, steadily building accommodations and, you know, back and forth and those types of things. That's right. I think that's right. And it's also, and I don't like to say, I don't like to use the word finding balance because actually that's a very rare thing to do. It indicates there's one fulcrum, you know, one point where you've got balance. So I prefer to think about avoiding imbalance. Um, which is sounds the same, but it's actually there's actually a distinction between finding balance and avoiding imbalance. Um, and I think the avoiding imbalance is what what I would recommend as a mindset for academic couples, and to make sure that that one keeps the perspective as long term as possible, so that this is going on now, but it's not going to be always. Um, and I also think it's about you know the individual the individual's relationships with each other. That sometimes, you know, what was hardest for me with a split position thing and having the position at UC Santa Barbara and Jack didn't, I think Jack wasn't so bothered by it because he was okay inside. He had a lot, he has a lot of self-confidence and also he was getting his ant work, you know, he was getting his research done. But on my part, it was very, very difficult because I felt this constant sense of guilt of, oh no, you know, Jack doesn't have a position and I do, and he's just as good a scientist as I am. And so I had to constantly deal with that sense of, oh no, you know, this isn't, this isn't good enough for him. So I think it's, it, it, this, this concern, this tension goes in, in many, many directions when you think about trying to work out how spouses can work out their lives in academia. Yeah, that's a very valuable perspective and I'm sure people will appreciate hearing it. Um, now, because AIBS is a scientific society, I am obliged to ask a question about scientific societies. Uh, you founded one, uh, but beyond that, how have they played a role in your career? Sure, so I think scientists, the scientific societies are incredibly important. I mean, I think academics tend to identify themselves with, this is my university. I'm at University of Utah. I'm at 
at Harvard University. But scientific societies give us a bigger identity and a and a and a more specific kind of set of interactions in the web of relationships that are needed for a, a strong academic and personal career. So yes, you're right. I I actually um, started a scientific society called the International Canopy Network back in 1996. Um, this is when there were very few canopy researchers, but there was a lot of excitement about canopy research. There was no society that really existed that would bring canopy researchers together, even though we were scattered geographically all over the world and in different disciplines. And so uh, then graduate student of mine, Joel Clement, and I started the International Canopy Network as a nonprofit. And our idea was to provide scientifically sound information to scientists, to educators, and to conservationists. So we did a lot of work. I started a database. I started an email bulletin board so we could converse with each other, started a website. We started a citations database. Um, we had some meetings um, and, and conferences. We tried to start a graduate program, but it never took off. Um, but anyway, that was a really important way that I think promoted the ability of canopy researchers to be effective, not only in terms of their science, but also in terms of providing science about the forest canopy to school teachers and to, to the media as well. But I have to say that, you know, that had really, that was really important for canopy researchers, but, but the scientific society that I have been, I guess, that has been most useful to me is the Ecological Society of America, the ESA. And I, you know, I've been a member ever since I was a graduate student and it was actually I think that sort of launched my career because I gave a talk on, in, you know, the year I graduated with my PhD um, at the ESA meeting, which people heard. That's what led to my first academic appointment. And ever since then, I, I've gone to ESA meetings, and that's where I exchange information, get to know people, and introduce my graduate students. Um, I did serve as an administrator or in governance of the ESA for three years. I was the vice president for education and diversity. And I have to say that I realized like that is not my thing. I'm not, I'm not very good at it. It just was so bulky. You know, it was so bound by like, here's how you make a, a motion and here's, you know, everything just happened so slowly. And I, 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 so after three years, I thought, I'm really glad I did that. I had that and it, that experience, but I don't think I want to continue with it. But I'm really grateful to, to all of the people who do put in their time, you know, to help so scientific societies move forward in those ways. And as far as AIBS, I don't have much experience with, you know, with its administration, but of course I'm an avid reader of bioscience and I just love the combination of, of articles that are primary research and review articles and then concept and insight papers. And I really feel like because bioscience goes to all biologists, there's this really different impact of of work that gets published in bioscience versus, say, the family of ecology journals. And I know that when we recently published a paper about uh, a science uh, engagement, a public engagement of science uh, program, the STEM ambassador program that I started a few years ago, we published our results in bioscience. And I can't tell you how that has really validated what, we, what we're trying to do, which is to train scientists to carry out public engagement in venues outside of academia. And by having that sort of bioscience brand on it, it just gives a lot of verification and validation to the scientific world. Oh, and thank you for the kind words. And let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, you know, whether it be the ambassador model or other forms of outreach, which has, you know, clearly played a, a major role in your career. How do you feel about, you know, that sort of role for scientists? Is it is it an obligation? Is it, um, you know, a part of the work that's kind of instrumental to the everything else you do, or how does it play in? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll answer that question for myself first. For me, as just as someone who has an extroverted personality and a background in performance in modern dance, to me, science has always been both about the pure research, so to speak, the measurements, the interpretation, the analysis, and the reporting in scientific journals, as well as spreading the word about how cool the canopy is or how important trees are, or um, waking people up to the fact that, you know, trees provide all kinds of things to humans and we need to protect them. Now that's me. Um, I also feel that there are many other scientists like me who see validity and importance in both the scientific work and the public engagement work. And I think 
that science needs to recognize and accommodate that and in fact do everything we can to support it. At the same time, I understand that when you have a scientist who may not be extroverted or who finds just a whole lot of meaning in naming that next ant species, like my husband, or making that next biochemistry discovery, that it is sufficient for that person to say, I published that work in the Journal of Biochemistry or in the Journal of Social Insects, because that contribution is, is part of the scientific record. And I think, really, there's nothing nobler than that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I love doing it myself. I have tons of very obscure publications on my on my CV. But what I think needs to change is for the scientific community, scientific funders, foundations, and policymakers to understand that if a scientist wishes to communicate directly to the public or to agency people or to people outside of academia, then they should be given the tools and their permission to do that, that it's not a waste of time, that it in fact can be a benefit to one's scientific research and teaching as well. So I am always proponing that that scientists who want to do public engagement, who even have an inkling of wanting to do it, should be provided with those tools. And that's what I'm kind of trying to do right now with the time that I have for devoting to public engagement is training scientists to think about ways that they can effectively and efficiently exchange and engage with groups that are outside of academia, especially those that are kind of far away from academia. Because I don't think there's enough time to just communicate with people who already know that academics are important or science is important or trees are important. I think we need to go beyond that. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because, you know, I think one of the things that I've often fretted about on, you know, um, this show and, and anywhere else anybody will listen to me is the, the fear that in doing science outreach, we wind up reaching and creating content for the people who already are on board and already see the value of science and already, you know, kind of support that with their voting and with their, you know, with their pocketbooks. It's, you know, the importance of reaching outside that relatively small circle that science communication is not quite crack the code on. How do you see that? Yeah, no, what you're what you said is totally in line with what I believe and I remember there was this in, this moment when I was sitting in the canopy of a fig tree in Monteverde and I heard this chainsaw like right outside the Monteverde Cloud Forest Reserve and I realized my gosh, you know, if they're right outside the reserve, I've got to do something. I've got to do something more than only writing my little scientific papers for my little set of colleagues. And that's when I began thinking, okay, time for me to do public engagement. I don't really like talking to policymakers. That's not what I'm good at. You know, they always want a yes or a no, how many species are going extinct tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, what I could do is, is, is do public engagement because people are really curious about, you know, a small brown woman climbing 100 feet up into the forest canopy and making discoveries. Like, that's pretty compelling. So I started working with the National Geographic Society, making television specials, you know, writing for Natural History magazine, working in, um, you know, giving talks in museums. And at first, I, and starting the International Canopy Network. And at first I thought, hey, I'm doing this really great job, you know, pat me on the back, I'm actually going outside of academics. But then I very soon realized the only people who read National Geographic, the only people who watch those documentaries are people who already know science is great and think trees are cool. So that's when I began thinking about how do I get to people who don't necessarily think trees are cool or won't don't have the finances or don't have the capacity to visit real nature. So that's when my students and I came up with this idea of treetop Barbie, like little girls love. Well, they love Barbie all over the world. In fact, my own daughter, you know, who's like six or seven years old at the time said, mom, can I get a Barbie? I was appalled. I was horrified. But, you know, where did I go wrong? But then I realized, why don't we just piggyback messages about conservation and how important it is for women to study the forest canopy onto something that girls already love and cherish, Barbie. So I called Mattel and I said, would you like to have a treetop Barbie? I think it's a good idea. They, they just said, no, no, we design our own Barbies, forget it. So my students and I began designing our own treetop Barbies. We went to Goodwill stores, we bought used Barbies, we got volunteer seamstresses to make field clothes, we bought little helmets on eBay. Um, <clears throat> And, I and we made a little notebook um, called Canopy Plants of the Pacific Northwest, which we included with Treetop Barbie when kids would, you know, when, would order them. Um, I just advertised it on my website, but it was picked up by the New York Times. 
and, and you know the sort of the story was a scientist was partnering with with Barbie um, and then Mattel called me back up and they said uh, you can't do this you're encroaching on her brand and I said no but take the idea I'm not trying to make money just take it you, you'd get lots of new customers if you if you do this um, but they said, no, 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 we have to shut you down. So I said, well, you know, I think I, I have a lot of journalist friends and I think they'd be interested in knowing like Mattel is trying to shut down a, a woman of color who's trying to encourage young girls to go into science. So they said, oh, okay, wait, 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 okay. So wait, 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 wait. So they allowed me to just continue in my very small little way of making treetop Barbies. Then 15 years later, I get a call from National Geographic. This was last year, 2019. They called up and they said, we've partnered with Mattel and they're making a new line of Explorer Barbie dolls. And we'd like you to be the advisor on this. So they were, they were making like wildlife photographer Barbie and astrophysicist Barbie and polar marine biologist Barbie. And so I advised them on the, you know, the accessories and everything. And then they made this one of a kind treetop Nalini looking Barbie, uh, which I have here in my lab. And um, it, was, it was this sort of recognition that you can go outside of your realm. In fact, you can even work with with objects that you don't believe in, like a plastic Barbie who represents the worst of our consumeristic society. But if you bring those two together, if you bring the values, the existing values of that sector of society together with the values, the ecological values of trees and canopy exploration, then you have something that you can disperse to people outside. So that was, that was sort of set the pattern with the public engagement work that I've done ever since. I learned that over 80% of the world's population self-identifies self as being religious or believing in God. Now, I don't believe in God. I had this weird mixture of Hinduism and Judaism, like what does a Hindu Jew believe? Um, but I recognize that there are a lot of people out there who really believe in religion and God. And so if I could somehow find common ground about the values of trees with religious values, I might have something going. <clears throat> and so. I, I downloaded the Bible and the Quran and the Talmud and, and Buddhist stories and I did a search for all the words tree and forest in those holy scriptures because I know that people who are in that religion believe already in those holy scriptures, right? That's, that's what they believe in. <clears throat> so then I started putting together, what are those verses about? What do those verses in those holy scriptures tell us about trees? And it turns out that trees are used as symbolic symbols, religious symbols. Um, they adorn temples. Uh, they are location markers. They provide practical uses like food and, and shelter. And so I was able to put together um, a sermon called Trees and Spirituality. And then I started knocking on doors of churches and synagogues and temples and saying, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a biologist, but I've read your holy scriptures and I've learned I've learned about what you all believe in trees. And could I give a sermon on your pulpit or your bima to tell your congregation about this? And lo and behold, well, it was the Unitarians, of course, that you know offered me a place at their pulpit first. But after that, I began giving sermons. I've given sermons in like over 40 places of worship. And I've never once had an experience where people would say, well, well, then what about evolution versus creationism? There was no conflict because I had drawn on their authorities. I had been what I call intellectually humble and said, I'm going to put aside me telling you and shoving down your throat everything that's important about the ecological values of trees. But instead, I want to tell you about what I read in your scriptures, your authorities, and what I learned from you about how valuable trees are. And so it was just like this amazing finding of common ground that resulted in, in no conflict, but rather help. In fact, there was this one guy in a Baptist church that I spoke with, and he came up to me after my sermon and he said, Dr. Nadkarni, could I get your email, please? And I thought, oh God, here it comes, you know, he's going to proselytize his woman, going to want me to turn me a Baptist. And I said, you know, I'm a Hindu Jew. I, I really don't believe in God. I, I will never be a Baptist. It's really not worth it for you to try to tell me about being a Baptist. He said, oh no, I wasn't going to ask you about being a Baptist. We're having a tree planting get together on Sunday afternoon after church next week. And we thought you and your students might be interested in joining us in protecting God's creatures, God's trees, God's creation. And I was just like, I just took me a minute 
to realize how wrong I had been, what assumptions I had made about somebody in a church about his beliefs in or desire to help trees. I had made completely the wrong assumption. And so it taught me that if we scientists can go with a more open mind to places, to sectors, to venues where we think we're going to be shut out like churches or Barbie or Mattel, you know, we, we have another thing coming. And I think it's really a matter of our opening our minds to the possibility of learning from, gaining from these groups so that, so that going back to your other question, <clears throat> you know, providing outreach or sharing our knowledge with other people doesn't have to be a burden. It can be a benefit to us and it may not happen every time that you get asked to join a tree planting uh, activity, but I think it's the attitude that we scientists might change in ourselves that, that, that we don't have to just preach. Literally, we can also be the listeners to information about the values of nature to us and to the planet. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And it, is that the key, the, you know, being open to, you know, the things that you're hearing as well as the things that you kind of know to be true on a scientific basis? Is that is that the big difference between something like, you know, the, the deficit model, which we've talked about before, in which, you know, you're kind of trying to pry open someone's mind and pour information into it and just hope that they're going to come out yeah. and, um, you know, support conservation. Is, is that the big difference? I think the big difference is that with a deficit model, that is the idea that, oh, if we just pour facts into it, then people will accept it and they'll make the right decisions. But I think there's something in addition to that. And that comes from sort of, I think I can maybe explain it by flipping, flipping it. That is, look, I do not care about sports. I mean, I love sports. I play sports, but I don't care about professional sports. I just don't see the point of the Super Bowl, whatever, you know, here's 11 guys smashing into each other. Like, what's the point? But a lot of people are very, very excited about the Super Bowl or about a baseball game between professional teams. And I think if someone tried to convince me by giving me statistics about how interesting the game is or how important this game is, or how great this ball player was, I'd still go like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't know why you would do that. But I did learn that baseball bats are all made of wood. For the American League and the National League, they're all made of either ash or maple. Now, that is an interesting fact to me. That would take me to a baseball game because I'd wonder, like, is the bat made of ash or maple? And why are they using you know, wooden bats instead of metal bats? And it would draw me into this whole world of professional sports. So to me, that, that's the same thing. If, if I can present ecological information or the importance of turning the tide on climate change or stopping deforestation by providing some link, some connection to what other sectors of society already value, that's going to be the draw in. It's not how many species of mosses there are, are on a branch. It might be, hey, this plant provided medicine, taxol, you know, is derived from the Pacific yew tree. The bark of it has produced the most important anti-cancer drug in the last 50 years. Somebody who knows somebody who's died of cancer is going to care about the Pacific yew tree more than they are about the moss diversity on some tropical tree in Costa Rica. So it's about opening your own mind to come to think about what are the other values, what are the values of other people, of other sectors, and connect, even by a very small thread, what you want them to know about that and what you might want to know from them. And that was the same thing that sort of drew me to my work with prisons. I began thinking, oh my God, you know, I've always thought, I've always worried about all these people who are, you know, 2.3 million adults are locked up in, and incarcerated in our country, the greatest number of any other country in the world. And the conditions of that that are fostered by mass incarceration are just so terrible. What, you know, what can I do about that social justice problem? And that's when I began thinking about, they're not only locked up and away from the people that they love and the ability to, you know, to earn a living, um, they're also deficit in nature. Prisons are places without nature at all and without the benefits of psychological and emotional benefits of working with nature, of growing things. And so back in 2004, I thought, well, who would value nature more than anybody? Probably prisoners. And as it turned out, there's this ecological problem in, in the Pacific Northwest where people are harvesting mosses from old growth forests of the temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest for the horticulture trade for sale in floral bouquets and so forth. And they're just ripping them off. And I know from my own research, it takes decades for these mosses to grow back. So I thought, well, if I could learn how to grow these mosses, 
in a horticulturally sound way, they wouldn't people wouldn't have to pull them out of the wild. And that's when I thought that might this might be the pro the the pro project that would allow prisoners to interact with me because mosses are small. You don't need sharp tools to work with them. You know, they're wonderful to touch and feel and smell. And so I located this minimum security prison, the Cedar Creek Correction Center. Um, and I asked the superintendent, who turned out to be a very forward thinking administrator, <clears throat> whether I could engage his, his inmates in helping me learn how to grow these mosses. And it turned out to be just a great success. After 18 months, we knew which species grew fastest. They were involved with nurturing and caring for the mosses. We taught them about moss biology. And that led to my starting a, a lecture series where I brought in other scientists to give lectures to these inmates and the officers about aspects of science. And that also led to a bunch of other conservation projects, rearing the endangered Oregon spotted frog, rearing the federally listed Taylor checker spot butterfly, uh, growing 17 species of rare prairie plants for the Nature Conservancy restoration projects. So the inmates were, were intimately involved with the touching, the growing, the caring for, the learning about these living things and understanding that they could contribute to these efforts to preserve these species. And that's a very powerful thing to present and offer to someone who's incarcerated because everyone else is telling them, you're useless, you're bad, you screwed up, you can't do anything. But it reinforced in me this knowledge, this deep, certain knowledge that if presented with the opportunities, everybody, everybody can contribute to conservation. We just have to provide it in the right mode, the right delivery method, but, but everyone can do that. And everybody that got involved with this was really happy about it, felt really fulfilled by it, wanted to do more. And I think that showed me that, well, this is true not only for inmates who, or those who are incarcerated at the moment, but maybe for other people who are also not, you know, nature is not accessible, like people in senior assisted living centers, like my mom, who's 97. Um, she has almost no nature at all. She can look out the window, but she's got nothing in terms of actually interacting with nature. So could we apply what we learned in the prisons to senior assisted living centers or to military people who are in barracks or toll booth operators? I always worry about, you know, they just face eight hours of traffic all day long. So it's part of this bigger picture of understanding the values of nature to people of all kinds and having scientists and restoration ecologists and conservationists think of ways to reach those people as well as the people that we commonly think of as accessible and eager to do conservation. I think, I think we underestimate the capacity for the desire to contribute to conservation in the human population. And what's the challenge like of getting other scientists to think in this way? Um, because, I mean, obviously that's going to be, you know, the, the next thing in ensuring that this is propagated further and that more of these opportunities reach the, you know, the general public. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> well, when I started doing these kinds of kind of out there public engagement, I just kind of did them by myself. You know, I'd go to a church, talk to the church. Group. I'd go to a prison, talk to the prison person. You know, I'd go to the rap singer, talk to the rap singer. And, and um, I could do it because, you know, I, I don't see any problem doing it. That's just sort of what I do. And I can sort of figure out ways to do that. But the challenge was, how do you teach other scientists to do this? And so I got a grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, this was one of their eager grants, their early sort of high risk, potential high payoff type grants to start what I called then the research ambassador program. And I gathered some scientists and I sort of taught them one on one. Here's how you go about doing. Here's how you figure out what is the shared value, you know, but it was, it was very small scale. It was very one-on-one. -on -one. And then I didn't get funded to like expand it because I hadn't figured out how to teach it. So I did, I ended up collaborating with some science of learning experts, some science communication researchers, an expert in design thinking from Stanford. And together we put together a proposal to the National Science Foundation, to the Advancing Informal STEM Learning Group. Um, and we got a, a, a grant, a good size grant, to start what we then called the STEM Ambassador Program. And so what we've done is to sort of take apart the different steps that it takes to first just think about who, which audience are you going to connect with? And we use what we call now the impact identity of the scientists. That is, we have a, what we call a connections interview where we say, what are your science interests? You know, what do you study? What are you studying? 
And we get, you know, uh, I study trees, physiology, tropical rainforest, blah, blah, blah. Then we say, what are your hobbies? Oh, well, I turn wooden bowls. I go snowboarding. I, um, I'm, and then we say, what are your personal characteristics? Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a Catholic or I'm a mother or um, I, I, I shoot billiards. You know, that's my favorite thing to do. And so we try then to say, well, if you look at all of those, what we call keywords, your research interests and your personal characteristics, what sort of falls out there? So for me, you know, like for this, this tree religion thing, trees and spirituality, I would have put down, you know, I am of a mixed religious background. I study trees and I'm open-minded. And that might have been boiled out. Oh, well, then you could think about connecting with religious groups, with faith-based groups. And then we think about how do you connect with them? Well, I chose to look, think about giving a sermon, but I've also done other things. I've made little booklets about the trees and the churchyards of those churches with information about the biology and the scriptures that relate to that species. I've given Sunday school talks. I've given lectures in seminaries to clergymen to be. Um, so there are all these different ways that you can get at a faith-based community, but the connection is what's important to establish with that scientist. So it may not have much to do with that person's research as it has to do with who they are as a person. And that then allows them to make that connection to the public group. Do you have any advice for, you know, early career scientists who are kind of embarking on this this sort of thing and, you know, may or may not have access to, you know, your program specifically? Yeah, I think the, I think one of the pieces that one of the pieces of advice that I always give to people, whether they're emerging <clears throat> scientists like graduate students, um, is to be fine with starting small. Very often when, especially, you know, I, I get invited to a lot of universities to give talks to graduate students and, and departmental seminars, partly because of my canopy research, but I think mainly because of this sort of out there public engagement work that so many young young scientists are really deeply interested in doing themselves. Um, and they look at me and they go, oh my God, you have a nationwide prison program. You know, you've talked to 40 churches. Like, I don't have time to do that. I've got to get my dissertation done. So I tell them there are all kinds of ways you can do public engagement just as effectively, but on a small scale that you have time for. Like for instance, I was in Seattle one day, I had a couple of hours to kill before a meeting, and I saw these two young women at a bus stop talking about their fingernails. They had painted their fingernails and they were like looking at each other's fingernails. Again, like I don't care about fingernails at all, but I saw that they were really interested in fingernails. So I said, hey, I can use these two hours to get a manicure and I'll ask the manicurist to paint little trees on my fingernails. So she did, and she used bright green paint, so they were very noticeable. And so for like two and a half weeks, I could just walk around and people would not, especially young women, would notice my fingernails, and I could say, oh yes, yes, they're trees. And let me tell you about how great trees are. They're just fantastic. They provide us with oxygen, they provide habitat, you know, so, and then I would ask them, What's your favorite tree? Do you have a special tree that's special to you? And so we'd have this conversation about how how great trees are that were precipitated by this very small thing, this simply going in and get your fingernails painted. And it sounds silly, but you know, if all of us did that, in fact, I did the math. I found out that there are 325 million people in the United States. There are 6.2 million scientists and engineers. So if each of us scientists or engineers talk to just 52 people a year, that's one person a week, we will have talked to and had contact with every single person in our country. So that's not hard, right? You go get a latte, you chat with the, the barista about shade grown coffee, you know, bingo, there's your one, your one conversation a week. And so I think that we want to tell scientists that it is it is certainly possible to devote a lot of your time, a lot of your career, a lot of your effort towards public engagement, towards knitting together science and society. And that's a, a wonderful thing to do. You can do that as a profession. You can work in a museum. You could work for an agency. But even if you're committed to the rigors of an academic life, which value published papers over talking to Boy Scouts, you can still carry out public engagement in these small but significant ways. And I think we can all do that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm wondering, what's the end game there? It's not purely just getting people to, you know, support the policies that we, we wish that they, you know, would support that are pro-science. Um, is there something deeper there as well? I think there are many goals to that kind of work. Um, 
<clears throat> certainly one of them, I think the underlying, <laughs> I mean, if we're going to be honest about it, the underlying thrust or goal is to instill a sense of trust and the knowledge of the possibility of exchange with a scientific way of knowing. Because I do, in my heart, in my mind, believe that science is the best way of knowing. But I think we can also recognize there are other ways of knowing that are also valid, uh, intuitive way of knowing, indigenous ways of knowing, even religious ways of knowing can be valuable in terms of coming to understand how this incredibly complex world works. So I think by putting a scientist out there to have a conversation about finger trees on fingernails is, is about raising awareness, maybe in a surprising way, <clears throat> to people who haven't thought that much about the values of trees and making them aware of it. But it's also about saying, hey, I'm a scientist and I'm having a conversation with you. And we're having a good conversation. And I'm listening to you. So maybe if you trust me in this, this little interaction here, you might trust science and scientists on this other issue. Should you get vaccinated against COVID or not? Can you trust Dr. Fauci or not? You know, all of these questions, is, is, is climate change real or not? And so I think the more we can build up those little bricks of support, of trust, of interaction between scientists and the public and non-scientists, the better we collectively are in terms of promoting, if you will, our message that science is something, is a way of knowing that can be trusted, that can be valued, that can be listened to, and that in fact can also be inclusive of other ways or people who have potentially other ways of knowing as well. Well, I think that's a, a very important message um, and very well put and also a good note on which to leave the conversation. Dr. Nadkarni, thank you very much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you, James. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.